Thank you for the introduction. So I don't have to introduce myself. I won two minutes. <laughs> but uh, let's uh, make it clear. How long can I uh, be? No, but um, the coffee, coffee break is planned at 11. Yes. OK, I will try to keep okay. the timing. First of all, because uh, I have to say a big, big thanks to Leif. He has explained a lot of physics, which uh, I was very hesitant how to approach. Because I know uh, myself, I also organized uh, ESA uh, summer school that with the invited lecturers, there is always a very big risk of getting the same story several times. But also, there is another issue that you are coming from very many different kinds of backgrounds. And it is very difficult to find the balance. So please, anytime when something is missing, ask questions. And when something is too boring because you have already th heard five times, although I'm lucky I'm at the beginning of the course and not at the end, <laughs> then stop me. Because I also wanted to start with some basic terms. And um, definitely I would like to um, avoid equations and uh, very uh, much detail. I would like to give you an overview. My task is to, uh, to talk about water, water over land, so the, uh, the land phase of water cycle. And um, hereby, I would like to point out a few things which I find important from this point of view. And I hope that they, this way the, uh, oh, don't put that there because my uh, name is not written correctly there. <laughs> so anyway. Um, by the way, did I put, yes, so there you can find uh, my affiliation as well as my email addresses. So please don't hesitate sending email uh, if you have any question. So first of all, I would like to point out one thing that is coming very nicely out from Leif's um, presentation as well, that Earth's observation, remote sensing is measurement. We are measuring, and with the exception of measuring gravity field, we are measuring somehow electromagnetic radiation, different aspects of electromagnetic radiation, and in this sense, uh, intensity is important for us, as life already spoke about the importance of polarization in um, microwaves, that's extremely important for us, and of course, we are uh, talking about um, waves or also the wave characteristics. So we can measure related to phase and we can measure time that is needed for emitting and receiving this radiation. So practically, this is what we can measure. But as you could see also from life's presentation, we are not interested in the intensities. At least the societal uh, benefit of intensity is relatively small. When there is this uh, ship completely frozen in ice, uh, I think uh, they don't mind uh, uh, intensities. I would like to show this uh, figure. I like it very much because it shows also what are we measuring and how much of that is available for our measurements. And this is now the total energy, the total energy budget uh, of the Earth. And you can see that our energy comes practically from the sun. This is the incoming energy or downwelling energy, as you uh, wish, which is uh, practically, I made a big mistake. Please let me just. Put it sleep. Sorry. So the downwelling energy is then partly reflected back in 
Earth observation or remote sensing, we can measure what is coming upwards. So we can measure those electromagnetic waves which are coming from the, uh, from the uh, Earth and the Earth and the atmosphere together. Which part of it is uh, carrying information for us? Of course, that part that is having an interaction with the target that we are interested in. Those who are metallurgists, they are interested in the atmosphere. Those who are hydrologists, they are interested in water. Those who are dealing with uh, ecology, interested in uh, vegetation and animals. So we have to understand what the interactions are, and we have to understand how we can deduce information from the measured electromagnetic energy uh, about what we want to know. First of all, we see that the atmosphere has an enormous role. It is absorbing energy. It is radiating energy back. So as we also could uh, hear from life, atmosphere plays an important role, and the uh, constituents in atmosphere play uh, an important role. Uh, as we saw, gases, we have the atmospheric windows where we can make the measurements themselves. And also the aerosols, the particles, they uh, play important role for us. And many of them are wavelengths dependent. And this is a very interesting thing, what we could also see uh, when we were talking about uh, frequency or when we are talking about wavelengths, we are talking about the same thing. So let's have a look. We are interested in the surface. What are those fluxes which are leaving the surface? First of all, we have convective fluxes. Energy with uh, turbulent transport, with convection, emerges from the surface to higher parts. But there is a trick. Watch out. This doesn't reach the place where we are uh, measuring. Furthermore, we have latent heat. Hydrologists, metallurgists are very much interested in this latent heat because this is the energy that is used for evaporation. And this latent heat is the energy that is released when the vapor is condensated. So practically, this plays an enormous role. You have a look uh, compared to the incoming 341. This is about 80, fine. And this latent heat is a proxy, practically for us, to estimate the amount of water that is playing a role in this latent heat. And, for, uh, and lately, we have the radiant energy that is ex uh, exiting the top of the atmosphere, partly reflected from the surface. This makes the very nice uh, Google Earth images about the garden of your grandmother. And some other energies, which are long wave energies, and uh, which are related for calculating what we can use for calculating the energy balance, what we can use for looking at sea ice, and so on and so on. So, we are measuring electromagnetic energy. And this complex system with a lot of feedbacks and a lot of loops, this complex system allows us to use only a small part of the uh, energy that plays a role in it for deducing our information. And this is the trick. In fact, when we are analyzing Earth's observation, we are deducing information from our measurements from those objects that are more important for the applications. So practically, we want to get soil moisture. Soil moisture we can get, and we will see this uh, this morning, from different measurements. So we have to know that what kind of interactions there are between the object that we are interested in and the energy that we can measure. 
in this case, for example, the top layer of the soil, which, is, which can be wet or which can be less wet, just exactly at the analogy of the water in the snow, can modify the signal that we get. And we measure the signal and we can deduce information about the uh, soil moisture. And here comes the trick. Just from that sin single measurement that we are making, even though that can be at different wavelengths, and so on, usually we cannot deduce fully the information that we would like to have. So in many, many applications, we have to involve auxiliary data, and this auxiliary data partly is related to the way how we are measuring, for example, the geometry, but also it is related, about, uh, related to different kinds of distortions on our measurements, noise. We just heard that, for example, uh, clouds over the sea are kind of noise for de uh, defining uh, sea ice. Tell this to a meteorologist who is interested in clouds. So we have to be very, very uh, careful what uh, we uh, call noise, but we have to know those parameters which are related to this. And there are many, many of those data that we have to use which cannot be measured by Earth's observation. And that is, later on, you will have a much more detailed uh, insight into surface processes, land processes. Uh, I heard that Jose Moreno is going to give a few lectures about how to involve other measurements which are related to uh, our processes but uh, cannot be measured with remote sensing. Now, I'm a hydrologist. I'm interested in water, especially that very, very fresh and good quality water is needed for brewing beer. So, <laughs> so we have to be uh, aware of what is happening between the electromagnetic energy and water. We have seen the microwave part uh, in more detail. I will also show you the, the, uh, a lot from the optical part, simply because water is a very interesting substan substance. It has absorption, very low absorption around the visible part and it has enormous absorption higher up. That means that uh, if we want to look into the water, we have to use those parts where the absorption is very low. If we want to separate water from the rest, we have to look at wavelengths where the absorption is much higher. So, in the visible part, you can see that from the blue to the red, the absorption is increasing. And from this, you can even see that it's increasing further in the near infrared. And practically in the near infrared, all energy is absorbed by water that uh, uh, reaches its surface. Fine. The difficulty is that if we wanted to get uh, some information about water, we know the physical relation between the energy and water. It's not enough to know how the water is, because in water, in natural circumstances, we have a lot of other substances. And those, all those substances are absor uh, absorbing and some of them are scattering. Those which are uh, particles, they will be scattering. Those which are dissolved, they will be only absorbing. But also the scattering ones are absorbing. So very complex interactions are happening 
if we want to look into the water and we using that energy penetrates into the water, still we have to have very complex processes which are related to reflection and refraction, which is usually on the boundary of the two different substances, for example, the air and the water surface. We have the absorption and the scattering, as I already explained. Guys, you will get all the, all the uh, slides. I don't want to stop you. If you want, you can take photos. <laughs> but I think uh, it is worse. Uh, it is really worse. Uh, um, yeah, it's all online on anyway. Yes. It's, um, the lectures are being streamed. So uh, you can just go on the website and you can find the lecture and, and also the voice. So uh, The bad side of it that all my mistakes will be found. <laughs> You are laughing, but uh, I had to pass an English, uh, uh, an English test uh, in the Netherlands where I'm teaching, and first I failed because I just told them, oh, you have one of those recordings, take that one. And then I didn't want to invite the guy and sit there. He found all my mistakes and he said, no, 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 this guy doesn't speak good enough English. Then I invited for the receipt, I invited the guy and he was so happy. Very good, because he couldn't rewind. <laughs> OK. So here again, the famous atmospheric windows with the absorption uh, bands also in the visible. And as you can see, most important absorption is taking place where, where uh, the gas phase of water is absorbing. So. This is where you can measure atmospheric windows. It, unless you want to know something about the state of the atmosphere, where you can use also the scattering by the droplets, and m you can measure uh, uh, the amount of water here. You can measure what is underneath here. And of course, you can identify how much scattering is happening there in the windows. Now, microwave, I'm not going to talk too much about it, although I didn't know that life would speak that much about it <laughs> in advance, but I really, I really uh, uh, like it. But here I would like to point out one thing that life didn't speak that much about, although it was there, namely, that is the dielectric constant or electric permittivity uh, of the water, which is due to its dipole character, completely different from solid particles which are around water in uh, uh, the environment. And in this sense, uh, this is a good thing. We can separate the two things. We can separate the water from solid particles, but we could see also in life's presentation that in the moment when the water is frozen, it starts to behave because the molecules are more bound to the structure. It starts to behave as solid particles. So the dielectric constant uh, changes from 80, life was showing a graph to 10. The soil particles are uh, around three, five, uh, but the point is that one order of magnitude or more than one order of magnitude difference is there in the dielectric uh, permittivity or constant. The problem is that this is not the only parameter that defines how and what we measure with the microwaves. And one of the most important uh, disturbing parts is the surface roughness. The geometry of the measurement and the geometry of the measured uh, object. So in this uh, sense, we can measure, but we have to know that there are other uh, things that we have to know about the object if we want to 
measure directly water. These are the processes. Let's have a look how water occurs in nature, and let's have a look at what we can do with it. The famous water cycle, please, who is the, who doesn't see, uh, who hasn't seen this kinds of figure before? Is there anyone? No, okay, then it's easy. Let's have a look. Water surface. We know we would like to measure water surface, so we can look at radar backscattering. Mm, yes, because radar, for radar, water can uh, have a kind of complete scattering away from the sensor. We will talk about it. In optical and thermal, we would like to get it with the absorption related characteristics of water. But the moment when we want to measure the volume of the water, we are in a little bit more in a trouble. We can mostly use proxies. So I'm dealing with hydrology. Hydrology deals with the movement, uh, the fluxes of water and, and the amount of water. I cannot measure everything that I would like to need or I would like to have uh, in my uh, science. Soil moisture. We already spoke about it, that we, when we use microwave active passive, we can measure it because of the difference in the electric uh, constant of water and the surrounding uh, solid particles. So fine. We also saw the surface roughness problem. We will come back to it. Ice, no. I shut up. Because you have already got quite some information. But there was a question about snow, and I would like to come back. You had only half a sentence about it. That over land, the snow water equivalent is extremely important when we are uh, talking, about, uh, talking about water resources. And um, therefore, microwave can help in it with all those limitations that life was talking about uh, with melting uh, water in the snow and uh, the wet snow issue. Water quality. We have seen already that we can look into the water. We can see, even with our naked eyes, in the Caribbean, those who are going for diving, they can go down to 20 meters deep and they can still have sunlight penetrating the water. If you try to do this in some of the lakes here around, I'm not sure that you would get the same uh, penetration. So with optical, you can get something about what is in the water. With thermal, you can get information about the temperature of the water, but that's it. Practically here, because of the absorption characteristics of water, we cannot use microwave so much. Precipitation, already discussed, but I will spend a little more time on it. With radar, we could get information with temperature, we could get cloud properties, and I haven't put here, I should have put there the passive microwave, which is, a, which is an important part. So here is one mistake, you should correct it. Uh, that is used very intensively for measuring uh, precipitation. Again, we have the problem of solid and liquid part and what is reaching the surface, we will talk about it. Evapotranspiration. There are plenty of tricks, and if I had that many uh, euro cents, that many articles have been already published about how to measure uh, uh, evapotranspiration with uh, Earth observation, I'm not sure that I would be standing here. So the point is that you can deduce this information from proxies from land cover, but you can also deduce this information as we saw 
already by calculating, estimating the latent heat from the surface energy balance. And as you remember, not all the emitted energy is reaching the sensor. For example, the turbulent heat doesn't. The radiative part does. So deducing latent heat from this equation is quite tricky, but it can be done. Now, we have to look at those fluxes where uh, the intensity is uh, concentrated, and this is stream flow. Please note that we are now talking about fluxes. Fluxes, which means change of uh, water flow of water. For stream flow, we can use, again, only proxies. There is no direct way of measuring the stream flow from Earth's observation. So we can deduce this from water stage that we can directly measure. We can deduce this from the area covered. As we saw, we can deduce the area from remote sensing. Another important fl uh, flux is infiltration. Bad news. We cannot directly deduce information, but we can calculate it from regional water balance, for example. Looking at how much is evaporated, how much uh, was running off, and then you can get information about how much had been inf infiltrating. The negative process to this, where groundwater outcrops as form of seepage, quite important. It's not always coming out as concentrated uh, uh, springs. The seepage can be measured by or deduced from thermal in, uh, information and proxies, for example, vegetation. So we can say that, uh, in general, when we want to measure fluxes, we have to use more information than just the measurement that we have, especially that when we are measuring, we are measuring an instantaneous value, and fluxes are changes in time. So we have to use tricks to deal with this. And nowadays, more and more it is uh, becoming a practice. We integrate remote sensing, very uh, measured remote sensing variables into models, even directly with model, uh, with the data simulation. Good. A little bit it was abstract. So let's have a look at how we are measuring certain parts of the hydrological cycle. And I will not talk uh, now and in uh, uh, the lecture after the break, I will not talk about all these that I showed you, but some of the most important. Precipitation. First of all, we have to understand what kind of precipitation there is. And I'm pretty sure that in the coming lectures there will be much more about atmospheric processes than what I can show you now. But I would like to show the uh, very basic ones. Oh, yeah, it can be seen. Sorry, I was just uh, worried that I haven't seen that. Can you see that there is a cloud over there? Okay. <laughs> On my sc uh, screen it shows quite well uh, as that cloud as well. So uh, those who are metallurgists even know much, much more about it than I do. But uh, we see that there are many, many different kinds of clouds. And not only because of their formation, but also because of their physical composition. So all these metallurgical situations result in different kinds of clouds containing different particles. And that's very important in uh, uh, 
Earth's observation, we are using the emission by the clouds and the scattering by the cloud particles for detecting precipitation. But also precipitations have several, several different forms. I don't go into detail of that. But here comes the other important thing, and that is time. You know very well that uh, we can have uh, geostationary orbits, satellites on geostationary orbits, but those, uh, that orbit is a little bit too high. And uh, that orbit is, uh, I just want to make this also move. That orbit doesn't allow that very high spatial resolution, although that allows us to measure as frequently as we can scan the whole disk that is visible of the Earth. The result is that from geostationary orbits, you can get measurements by every 15 minutes nowadays with the uh, sec uh, second generation um, geostationary uh, 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 satellites. And if you go for so-called polar or quasi-polar orbits, you can get much closer to the surface, much higher spatial resolution, but you need to use other tricks for higher temporal resolution. Namely, what is used nowadays is satellite constellations, and the good example for this is the Sentinel, uh, um, Sentinel satellites, where you have always two satellites on the same orbit, 180 degrees apart from each other, and this way you can get a much more frequent uh, coverage that you could see there. In fact, oh, I have this pointer. This is one satellite and that is the other satellite for this. In the visible and, and near infrared, if you want to estimate or measure rainfall, uh, the idea is very similar to what uh, Leif already explained in the microwave. We are looking at the outgoing energy at the longer wavelengths. So the thermal, and, uh, thermal wavelengths are uh, uh, useful for this. And this outgoing long wave, uh, uh, long wave radiation differs from the background when you have a um, rain-bearing cloud. The simplest approach is just to say that precipitation is proportional somehow to the outgoing long wave energy. And for example, it was shown that from the, uh, even the first AVHRR uh, measurements from the thermal bands, you could explain the spatial distribution of rainfall from the spatial distribution of thermal measurements. This is used, for example, for regular monitoring of the rainfall at uh, not so uh, large spatial resolution with the geostationary satellites. Here you can see the footprint of uh, the five uh, uh, GMES, Meteosat, Insat uh, satellites which cover the whole uh, Earth. And we defined the rainfall from cloud top temperature. Very simple linear, uh, it's a very simple relationship. It says that all those clouds which are colder than 235 Kelvin are resulting in raining pixels. So in those pixels where you have uh, less than 235 Kelvin, and you can relate a uh, rainfall rate to it. The first simple approach was relating three millimeter per um, hour you can fine tune this and you can make different kinds of uh, differentiations according where you are and uh, which part of the earth. But this kind of 
rainfall estimate is just a rough estimate, and it is problematic. It's good for uh, the tropics, um, but it is problematic for the higher latitudes, and it's problematic for uh, um, less uh, pronounced cold uh, temperature, uh, cold uh, cloud tops. Back to microwaves, as we saw that when clouds are over uh, the sea, where the background is of very low temperature, brightness temperature, then clouds can be identified because the own radiation of clouds, the droplets, are increasing the temperature over the homogeneous background. So this way, you can identify them, uh, clouds, and you can even identify the total volume of precipitation that is in the uh, uh, atmospheric column. Here, that's easy. Clouds are warmer. The difficulty comes over the land, where the land is much warmer than the clouds. So here, clouds can still be identified, but just the way around, because of their scattering of the higher temperature, the more energy that is coming from the surface, scattering, and then you can deduce information about uh, rain-bearing clouds. The difficulty is that while the background of the ocean is quite homogeneous, the background of land is very heterogeneous, depending on the material and the land cover that we are talking about. So in this sense, um, passive microwave measurements over, cloud, uh, over land are a little bit trickier. I would like to share some uh, experience that we had uh, in this sense. A um, student of mine was looking at the water balance of a um, watershed. In fact, it's a closed basin in uh, Turkey. And he needed spatially distributed rainfall. Very nice. He turned to the uh, TRMM, uh, the Tropical Rainfall Measuring Missions data set. In fact, there are more data sets related to TRMM. And he looked at his gauge, gauge data, which he had a few in the, uh, in the uh, basin, and he compared it to the TRMM data. Definitely at the basic accumulation level that you can get from the TRMM website, three hourly or seven days uh, accumulation of rainfall, he didn't succeed too much. In fact, there was an enormous difference. There was practically no correlation between the rainfall that was measured in a small rain gauge with the rainfall estimated from aerial measurements of the TRMM radar data. The moment when he was aggregating further for more than one month, in fact, he was aggregating for one month, three months, half year, and so on. He found much nicer correlation, and those who know methodology uh, better than me, they would even say that, okay, that's quite obvious. You can get, in the dry season, lower correlation, in the wet season, higher correlation, simply because in the wet season you have more extended rainfalls and you have more frontal type of rainfalls than in the dry season when you have sporadic but very intensive um, <coughs> rainfalls, storms. So this shows very well that comparing rainfall measurement from satellite images and in situ measurements, we think in situ is correct. It's very tricky, especially that I'm telling you that the in situ has at least that much error that the 
that they're remote sensing based. We don't have to go into this uh, too much, but uh, long, long ago, I uh, read somewhere an article that they put 200 rain gauges out in a garden at different, at different uh, um, altitudes, uh, making it sure that what they were measuring were uh, statistically independent. And try to guess how large was the standard deviation of the rainfall throughout the year? Was it 1%? Was it 10%? Was it 50%? What do you think? In the, between 20 and 30. And the reason is that you have enormous spatial variations, and if you, if you look at the 200 square centimeters of uh, the rain gauge, if you are using that type, that is very, very small compared to the spatial variations of the rain. And you can make any kind of krigging, and there are many uh, statistical uh, publications of it, but the measurement that we are making is always prone to other effects and errors. And this mismatch is quite understandable, not because the satellite-based, remote, uh, the remote sensing-based rain measurement is inaccurate, but because both the remote sensing-based and the rain gauge-based measurement are inaccurate, measurement are inaccurate. Surface energy balance, we jump. We have from the water cycle, the water that is coming in. We see that we can measure something with it. When we are measuring, when we want to, we want to deduce evapotranspiration, or in fact, I like to talk about evaporation. When we want to deduce evaporation, we have to calculate the water balance of all these terms. The most important is the short wave incoming solar radiation, but that has an interaction with the surface, including vegetation. There will be a long wave outgoing radiation, as well there is a, a long wave incoming radiation. And as we uh, spoke about that, sensible heat and latent heat, this is the turbulent um, uh, energy transfer, and this is the evaporated uh, water represented energy transfer. And in the meantime, you have the atmosphere in between where you have turbulences, where you have uh, uh, advection, where you have different gases uh, behaving uh, quite tricky way as well as you have the surface, which gets this incoming uh, energy, and it absorbs a part of it. It conducts a part of it to deeper, but also it has its own temperature and own, uh, own uh, contribution to the energy exchange at the surface. Without going into detail, looking at this very a complex process. I will just show you one approach to it, that is the SEPS system the, uh, developed by Bob Sue, um, which uses partly metallurgical data for those that cannot be measured with Earth's observation. Namely, for example, the air temperature at the reference height cannot be measured from Earth's observation, but also it uses many data that can be measured from uh, Earth's observation. Those data are related to the state of the surface, related to the land cover, the vegetation cover, and the geometric and other par parameters of the vegetation, as well as Thermal infrared measurements are used for defining the surface temperature since 
practically these processes are driven by the temperature difference of the surface and the air. These data are put into a shaker, shaked well, and with using quite complex uh, uh, physics, especially describing the boundary layer, describing the state of the atmosphere. Finally, you be, uh, ooh, sorry for this. On my computer, it looks very bad, very, very good. Can you read anything from there? So here it's written turbulent heat fluxes. Here it is written evaporative fraction, and here it is written actual evaporation. The important in this, the actual evaporation that we can calculate. I don't think Chris it would help. Yeah, let's try. But I will try to interpret. So practically, uh, you can calculate the evaporated water by using the trick that the missing part of the surface energy balance that we cannot identify, that is the latent heat. And the latent heat is directly related to the amount of water that is evaporated. This is implemented in different uh, pieces of software. And even more, I think now you can find uh, more uh, software where SEPS is uh, implemented. If you are interested, you can find enormous amount of um, uh, information on the internet of this, and you can always approach me and we, uh, we can help you with code and, and everything that is related to SEPS. Time is running, so I would like to spend a short time, a quick look on an application, how the surface energy balance was used for completing the task that I already mentioned, the calculating the water balance of a catchment in uh, Turkey. It's a closed catchment, so luckily when we calculate the water balance, we don't have to deal with outflow on the surface, N uh, not, also not on uh, through subsurface outflow. So we have a basin with a deeper part with mountains around, and here, in the lower part, there is quite some intensive agriculture happening. The rainfall distribution is uh, quite uneven, so the precipitation and the ratio of precipitation and potential evapotranspiration is very high only in the mountains, where there is more precipitation than evaporation and very low in most of the area, it is less than uh, 0.3. That means that in most of this uh, area, there is an enormous deficit in incoming water. In the basin, they are pumping water from the ground, uh, ground to irrigate. There is a very big debate whether the sinking of groundwater table is due to this pumping or due to some other reasons. In fact, what we were doing first, a conceptual model was created, which says that we have the incoming precipitation that, as I already uh, told you, can be uh, calculated from satellite images. There is the outgoing evapotranspiration that we can calculate from uh, the surface energy balance. And in between, there are in, uh, internal flows. But in total, the whole thing has to be in balance. The water balance seems that if you have precipitation coming in, evapotranspiration uh, 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 or uh, evaporation going out, and if there was runoff, then the storage change should be zero, and then this whole thing is zero, since we don't have runoff. Evapotranspiration calculations were coming in here, 
And as I um, told you, we were separating the years into a wet and a dry part. Rain, which is also separated, was calculated from the TRMM uh, uh, maps. The problem is that those radar data are not sensitive to snow. So snow had to be calculated also separately. Here we needed in situ measurements, and we were estimating from in situ measurements the snow water equivalent, and we were correcting by monitoring the snow extent, the precipitation data, adding the snow extent uh, uh, with the snow water equivalent to the whole uh, balance. This way, we could create a precipitation map incorporating the snow into it from partly the satellite images, and we could create the outgoing part, the evaporation also, and the balance of the two will show us whether there is more water leaving the place or more water coming in. The difficulty is that I think I will go a little bit faster, that there are in the mountains reservoirs where they collect water and they use this water for irrigation. And they are pumping water from the groundwater. The result is that there was an enormous, I will skip this, there was an enormous uh, surplus, let me even skip this, there was an enormous surplus of evaporation in these red areas, you can see that there is even at some places 600 millimeter missing from the rainfall which is evaporated at that place. That means that by irrigation there was extra water added and that was evaporated, not the local rainfall which was coming in. And then came the tricky calculation. We have the drawdown of the wells. But if you locate the wells on the map of here, you can see these areas where you have uh, a surplus of evaporation over the incoming uh, precipitation. Estimating the water holding capacity of the ground, in fact, the so-called specific yield, which shows the gray area is the specific yield of that locations where the wells are. You can prove very nicely that, that the extra water that is evaporated over the incoming precipitation that extra water is coming indeed from the groundwater because that fits very well, the total volume fits very well the extra evaporated water. So in this sense, we could use Earth observation for both looking at precipitation and looking at evapotranspiration and we could deduce the water balance and we could deduce that how much is that water that is used practically uh, relating into irreversible processes or creating irreversible processes in the uh, area. This is the f end of the first half of the show. Any questions? Come on, there must be some questions. Yep. Thank you for the presentation. I have a question about some of the areas where you had a surplus of water. Is that from an error in the snow estimate or? No, look, 
uh, maybe I, are you referring to this? Yeah, the blue areas down. No, the, the blue areas. Part. These are the surplus areas. This is where the precipitation is more than the than the evaporation. So if you just take the precipitation map, which was based on Earth's observation, the evaporation map that was based uh, partly on uh, Earth's observation, the difference between the two shows a surplus in precipitation. This is where you have runoff, and this runoff is collected in reservoirs, and here is a lake collected also in this lake, although this uh, shows very high the surplus of uh, evaporation compared to the uh, precipitation, of course, because there is an uh, <coughs> open water surface. And then this lake is used through a canal, more or less here, used for irrigation water for the lower lying areas. So these are the irrigated areas. These are the huge irrigated areas. And this is where we had the deficit of rain. And that was partly substituted by these surplus areas. But this is not enough. Therefore, more was pumped, or more is pumped, to tell the truth. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I have just only a question about the equation of the soil water balance. Uh, did you include the irrigation, uh, the irrigation volume applied uh, into the precipitation, or why is not considered in the, in the equation? I would have loved to include it, but this, is, this was the unknown. In fact, what we have as surplus evaporated in, uh, in the total balance that is the irrigated water from the groundwater. So you can consider this surplus here, this surplus, which is more precipitation than uh, evaporation, as irrigation water applied downstream. But this is not enough to close the gap. And the, and the, the rest is coming from below the ground, and they are not pumping for swimming pools. They are pumping for um, irrigation. And why irrigation was not directly involved in the equation is very simple. Most of the wells are illegal. And this is one of the largest uh, political problem there. The Water Authority says that we know how many illegal wells there are, and we are always calculating with them, and blah, 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 blah. And this equation showed and this calculation showed that at least five times more illegal wells had to, uh, has to be there than uh, what they know or they say they know of. Thank you. I just have uh, one quick question. Um, so all these illegal wells that are drawing water um, from the, the groundwater, um, is it possible to directly measure the groundwater, as opposed to just estimating how much water must be drawn from it using interferometry or other techniques? In fact, there is only one measurement uh, method that helps us to get information about the groundwater directly, and that is related to gravity measurements. You can imagine that when a porous rock is empty, the bulk density is lower than when there is water in it. When there is water in it, its gravity is larger, so it modifies the gravity field. And you can deduce again from the gravity field changes, the changes of the amount of material under the satellite, and that amount of material, change of material, is because of the water. That is the fast changing part. The tectonics is not that fast, or sometimes uh, it is, but not always that fast. So direct measurement, but there, the spatial resolution is in the range of hundreds of kilometers. Although you can identify even a few centimeters of groundwater difference 
overall groundwater difference. This area that we were, uh, in fact, we were thinking about this. The area that we were uh, working at, this is 54,000 square kilometers, just a little small for these kinds of measurements. But in the Indus Basin, in the uh, Amazonas Basin, based on gravity measurements, groundwater change has been shown, and in, especially in the Indus, that is uh, tragic. So it has been proved that the green revolution in India has been drinking up the groundwater completely or very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, if there are no other questions, then we could go for the coffee break now, and then we come back here at... Okay.